As a kid, I went on exactly one hike with my dad, and I made him carry my backpack the whole way. We never went again. I rediscovered hiking in my 20s when I went to college in Oregon, and it was practically a graduation requirement. Two miles here, four miles there, I morphed into one of those people who wouldn't go looking for a hike, but I'd tag along if someone else suggested it. That same not eager but willing attitude eased me onto longer trails when I started dating my boyfriend, Justin, who was way more into hiking than I was. Two months after we met, he hiked the two highest peaks in Africa in the span of two weeks. I should have run, but I don't. While I warmed up to hikes longer than 10 miles, he gravitated toward through hiking. This is the kind of hiking where you carry all the food, water, and shelter you need on your back for days at a time. Then you pitch your tent at night just to pack it up in the morning and do it all over again the next day for fun. <laughs> According to Justin, this is type B fun. Type A fun is the kind you have when you enjoy the thing you're doing while you're doing it. <laughs> Type B fun is the kind you have only when all the hard yards are behind you, when you look in the rear view and laugh at the obstacles you left in the dust. My first taste of this kind of hiking came on a trail that spanned 90 miles around the base of Mount Rainier outside Seattle. Now the scariest thing about this trail isn't its length, it's that the elevation profile looks like a polygraph test gone horribly wrong. <laughs> we had planned to hike for 10 days until we got word of an incoming snowstorm halfway through. As a true Californian, I was not prepared for this kind of weather physically or mentally. But if we wanted to get out of the park before it froze, we'd have to cover almost 40 miles in two days. Okay. I looked him square in the eye and I gave him my best brave face. Let's do it. His eyes narrowed. What, you don't think we can do it? I feigned shock. Well, the problem is, he paused looking for the right words. You go as slow downhill as you do uphill. There's nowhere to make up time. He was right. I wasn't used to doing anything this demanding, and my knee had started hurting almost as soon as we'd started hiking. Why on earth had I agreed to this? I suppose I felt compelled at first because it was important to him. But now, now I had something to prove. I mean, what if I couldn't pull my own weight? Would this be the last hike we ever went on? At the very least, I was determined not to be the reason he didn't finish the trail. So I ate Advil like candy, and I skipped at the slightest sign of a negative slope. And we made it to the parking lot just as flurries of snow trickled to the ground around us. We learned a lot about each other on that hike. For example, I learned that Justin would never take the lead on a trail. He wants me to set the pace, even if it's painfully slow for him. He's chivalrous like that. And he learned that I will almost always bring too much food because the only thing that terrifies me more than getting eaten is not eating. <laughs> In the end, we laughed about the lecture he gave me and we chalked it up as a success. I boasted to anyone who would listen and to plenty of other people who clearly weren't interested. In retrospect, the struggle had been part of the payoff. I wore it like a badge of honor. When Justin came across another through hike, he met my certainty with apprehension. Do you actually enjoy it though? Or are you just doing it for me, he asked. If I was honest, I still wasn't sure. Were there things about it I hated? Absolutely, no one, and I mean no one, likes digging a hole to relieve themselves. <laughs> but I look back on most of it so fondly, I figured it was worth another shot. So we made arrangements to spend 4th of July weekend hiking the High Sierra Trail a 72-mile trek that traverses Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park from east to west, sorry, from west to east, and ends with an optional summit of Mount Whitney. <laughs> to be clear, summits with Justin are never optional. <laughs> Besides enough to feed an Olympian for a week, we needed three things. One, Permits from the ranger station detailing where we plan to camp and when, so they knew when to look for us in case of emergency. Two, 
bear canisters. Little barrels made of hard plastic where we could store our food at night so the bears wouldn't get into it. Three, wag bags. These are glorified Ziplocs we'd have to use as toilets when the ground was too hard to dig a hole because exposed feces is bad for everybody. Knowing we also had to carry these out with us somehow made digging a hole seem like a decent option. It left me wondering once again why I had agreed to this. Was I a masochist? But our first day stretched across low meadows and rolling hills shaded by giant sequoias, and we spent the night next to a river before climbing up toward Precipice Lake, a glacial feature made famous by Ansel Adams and turned into a picnic area by me. <laughs> this part, this part I definitely liked. An unusually wet winter had caused an abundance of snow melt to last well into the warm summer months. The pros and cons of this were as follows. Pro. Plenty of fresh water meant we didn't have to carry gallons at a time. This is good because water is heavy. Any amount of standing water created a breeding ground for mosquitoes. This is bad because I fucking hate mosquitoes. <laughs> at our second campground, we quickly realized that the jungle grade repellent we bought was no match for these free range bastards. We admitted defeat by eating dehydrated dinners in our tent and cowering there until the morning. Anytime he had the chance though, Justin insisted that the third day of a backpack is when you really hit your stride. <laughs> Allegedly, this is when you start eking past all the what the fucks your body is pointing out in the form of aches and pains and begin to feel like something resembling fit. For once, I wasn't totally annoyed when he was right. We fell into a meditative groove, our footfalls keeping rhythm as conversation came and went. That night, we made camp in an old pasture and ate couscous by a wood fire. We went to sleep with a smell of grass, smoke, and curry lingering in the humidity around the tent. There it was again, something small, something quiet yet forceful to really enjoy about this absolutely unnecessary challenge. <laughs> the fourth day threatened to maintain this suspiciously type A fun facade. After two miles, we lucked into an empty hot spring saddled beside the Kern River. In the concrete tub, we washed off several days' worth of dirt and unburdened ourselves of our grievances. Putting my shoes back on, I took a mental note. Add hot springs to the like of this category. But not two miles later, we came to an offshoot of the river that was so high, we decided it would be best to wait across barefoot because the last thing you want in the middle of a long walk is wet shoes. The exercise itself wouldn't usually be notable, but here at this crossing, the mosquitoes were so thick I could scarcely breathe. They were impossible to ignore as they tickled my nostrils and investigated my ears. I swatted furiously with one hand while I untied my shoes with the other, so flushed with panic I could only speak in single syllables. Ready? Okay, careful, good? Yep, go, 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 go. When the next campground wasn't any less infested, Justin looks at me quizzically. What do you want to do, he asked, exasperated. I got the impression he didn't like this part either. I don't really want to stay here, do you? There's a lot of daylight left and I don't want to spend it in the tent again. Me neither, he said, but the next climb is a big one. Then he gave me the snowstorm look. The stare that said, you're really gonna have to push if you wanna get out of here, and I'm not convinced yet. We had already gone 10 miles, and the next camp wasn't for another 10. We have plenty of time though, right? I pleaded. He hesitated, and I danced in place, itchy and impatient. Okay, let's go. He finally conceded, and I took off. Then I immediately hit a wall. <laughs> the climb was straight uphill. Not only that, but we were on our way to 11,000 feet, the highest we'd been so far. <sighs> I heaved with every step and I stopped to rest every other. In between gasps for air, I slammed small sachets of calorie dense gelatin and I nibbled on sesame crackers, trying to find nourishment without nausea. Whenever I caught my breath, I apologized for going so slow. Pole pole, Justin reassured me. It's a Swahili phrase he learned when he climbed Kilimanjaro. It means slowly, slowly. And it's a reminder that it doesn't matter how fast you go, you can get anywhere one tiny step at a time. Almost anywhere, anyway. We caved within a mile of the next camp. 
When Justin took out tortillas and a foil packet of tuna, I refused to eat. I was too tired to chew and too queasy from the altitude to stomach even the idea of food. Never mind the smell of preserved fish. I could read the worry on his face. Hell, I was worried too. We were still 3,000 feet from the summit and I, lover of all snacks, didn't want to eat. Obviously this part sucked, like really sucked. Maybe I'd found my limit, hit the peak of the proverbial trail I set foot on in college. I was never gonna be Alex Honnold anyway. Guitar Lake should only be four miles from here and it's a little lower. Justin studied the map out loud the next morning, assessing for himself whether I could handle what came next. Four miles, I thought. I could do that. I'd hiked four miles still drunk. <laughs> By the time we got to Guitar Lake, I felt like myself again. I lounged like a lizard on sun-soaked granite, and I shamelessly ate bean burrito after bean burrito as the marmots watched with envy. The next morning, and our last on the trail, I woke up ready for Whitney. I was sure all my type B fun had sustained enough pressure to alchemize into the type A kind. It hadn't. <laughs> the final ascent humbled me to half my usual pace. I waddled like a penguin and pretended etiquette was the reason I frequently stopped to let other hikers pass. <laughs> Have you ever done that thing where you put one straw in your drink and one straw outside the cup and slurp in vain trying to get a little sip of liquid? This was like that, but with air. <laughs> we don't have to go up, you know, Justin volunteered at the junction to the summit. He had climbed Whitney once already, so this turned out to be the one time it actually was optional. This one was just for me. I couldn't tell you whether that made it more satisfying to finally reach the peak. Standing atop the highest point in the contiguous US, it didn't really matter why I had agreed to it or how long it took me. What mattered was the way the sun pierced the paper thin air to kiss the sweat on my skin. The way I kind of felt like the angel on a Christmas tree looking down at the tops of towering pines. What mattered was the way Justin looked at me when I looked down and shrieked about the 99 switchbacks that would carry us home. Thank you. Annalise Scoop, she made it to the top, everybody.